colloquia, um, we, we generally hold questions um, that, that require long arguments for after the talk, but uh, we also don't want people to just sit there confused if they just have a point they want clarified. So I will watch the chat um, and you can also use the raise hand function if you'd like to try to get a brief question in. Um, and uh, I am then going to turn it over now to uh, Joaquin Drut to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Josh. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, get to introduce uh, Gertje, a colleague and friend, uh, to this uh, for this colloquium today. Uh, uh, Gertje is one of our uh, uh, newest uh, faculty members at UNC, and he got his bachelor's in physics at Middle East Technical University in Ankara, in Turkey, in 2006. Um, then he came to the U.S. Um, for his PhD at the University of Connecticut. Um, he did his uh, PhD studies with Gerald Dunn there uh, and finished in uh, 2011. Then he was a postdoc at Stony Brook from uh, 2011 to 2014. And then at the University of Maryland from 2014 to 2017. Uh, he then became a visiting research assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, from 2017 to 2019. And then we were lucky enough to uh, get him uh, from there and, and, and have him uh, here since, since then, since 2019. So without uh, further ado, uh, Gertrude, please uh, take it away. Well, um, thank you, Joaquin, and uh, thank you, Joshua, for uh, the kind invitation. I'm very uh, happy to be um, here and giving this talk. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, talk about the search uh, for the QCD critical point, and QCD is the theory of strong interactions. I will come to that. And uh, the ongoing search for the conjectured um, uh, critical point in the phase diagram. Uh, before I move on to uh, QCD, though, let me uh, start with talking a little bit about the uh, critical point in general. Um, so if you take a pot of water and uh, start heating it, apply, uh, you know, put it on the stove and start heating it, uh, once the temperature reaches uh, 100 Celsius degrees, it boils. Uh, so boiling is bo boiling happens uh, quite abruptly. It's a uh, discontinuous transition from the water phase to the vapor phase, uh, also known as a, a first order phase transition. And uh, now if you put a lid on it uh, and do the same experiment, uh, the pressure increases a little bit and uh, you realize that the boiling point also increases uh, a little bit. So it bo boils at a slightly higher temperature. Uh, now, uh, you can sort of uh, um, think about what happens if I keep increasing and increasing and increasing uh, the pressure. Um, so what happens is that um, if I keep increasing the pressure, the boiling point of water also increases. So this is a, a, a diagram of uh, the, the sort of a more schematic uh, phase diagram of water. Uh, so the x-axis is the temperature and the y-axis is the pressure. So if I uh, increase pressure, uh, if I go high up in the uh, y-axis and start applying uh, heat, then I reach the boiling point here at a higher temperature. But th this trend uh, doesn't uh, continue uh, up all the way to infinity. At some point, uh, once the pressure reaches roughly uh, 218 atmospheres, um, boiling, the phenomenon of boiling completely disappears, it, it ceases to exist. And uh, there is uh, the transition between the liquid phase and the vapor phase um, is actually very smooth. It's a continuous uh, transition. In fact, uh, uh, above that uh, pressure and uh, temperature, there is actually no way to distinguish between liquid and vapor. They, uh, the, the, the separation of phases disappear. And the, the point where this first order phase transition ends is called the, uh, the critical point. Okay? And the phase above uh, these temperatures and pressures is sometimes also known as the, the supercritical phase. So um, this is not the peculiar feature of water. Water as a liquid has a lot of peculiar features, but having a critical point is not one of them. It's a fairly ubiquitous 
uh, thing in, in liquids. So I just pulled this from Wikipedia. Many different liquids have uh, a critical point at different pressures and uh, temperatures, but uh, it's um, a fairly universal uh, property. And furthermore, around uh, the critical point, uh, all the liquids actually behave in the same way. So this is uh, um, uh, the temperature, uh, the, the density, the difference between the uh, densities of the vapor and the uh, uh, liquid um, as, a, uh, uh, as a function of temperature, uh, both rescaled by the, 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 the value of the temperature at the critical point and the value of the pressure at the density at the critical point. And uh, all these different uh, liquids with different sort of critical points actually uh, behave exactly in the same way. So it is a fairly universal phenomenon, both the existence and the way that the liquids behave, even though they are very different liquids around the critical point. Um, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about the, uh, the history of it, which is uh, actually quite interesting. Uh, so the, the notion of the critical point actually goes back to uh, early 1800s. Uh, people were interested in what happens to liquids at uh, very high temperatures or what happens if you put a liquid in a closed container and heat it up. Uh, this was, of course, in the uh, context of steam engines. And uh, the, the particular sort of experiment that, that led to the discovery of the critical point goes back to 1822 uh, by a, a physicist named uh, Cagnard de Tour. And uh, basically the question he asked is, so if I have water in a closed uh, container and if I heat, 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 heat the water, uh, what happens? Um, of course, uh, for, for water, uh, these are the, the temperature and the pressure that around the critical point is very high. And uh, unfortunately at the time, there was no sort of transparent container where he could do the experiment. And he came up with this really brilliant solution to this problem that uh, uh, instead of a, a glass container, he used a, a cannon, okay? um, uh, and uh, which can withstand very high temperatures and pressures. Uh, of course, the problem with the cannon is that you can't really see inside. Uh, and uh, the solution he came up with uh, was uh, to put a cannonball and uh, basically listen to the splash as the as you roll the cannonball and uh, he noticed that uh, above uh, certain temperatures and pressure that splash disappeared so that he, he basically discovered the supercritical phase uh, and uh, and he published this in uh, 1822 so he uh, did this experiment with water alcohol and different sort of uh, different liquids and uh, he named this new uh, phase as a, a particular state. Right? Um, uh, however, uh, many of his uh, um, contemporaries uh, regarded this as some peculiar future of those liquids and didn't really pay too much attention to his discovery. Oh, by the way, he, he, he discovered that this transition happens at 362 uh, degrees and the actual um, a critical point is at 374, something like that. So he, he came very close. Uh, and uh, given the crudeness of the experiments, actually looked quite uh, remarkable. Um, and uh, it was uh, Dan Faraday who got interested in this problem. And uh, he uh, tried to come up with a name. He entertained uh, different names uh, and he settled on uh, the uh, Cagnard de Tour point for the name. And then uh, a little later, Mendeleev also uh, did experiments and he named uh, the crit what we know as, uh, as the critical point as the absolute boiling uh, temperature. And it was uh, an Irish physicist, Andrews, who uh, coined the name critical point. Um, then uh, in his PhD dissertation, PhD thesis, uh, Van der Waals uh, wrote for the first time uh, equations of state for the liquid gas uh, phase transition that involves a critical point. Um, what he did was also very brilliant that uh, he took the ideal gas equation of state and uh, the two elements, uh, a repulsive core and an attractive interaction, and that was enough to uh, 
to uh, have um, a critical point in the equation of state. Uh, and uh, studying the, uh, the work of Van der Waals, uh, Pierre Curie, who was uh, at the time uh, interested in uh, magnets and how magnets behave, how magnetism changes with different temperatures, um, uh, re realized that the same phenomenon also exists in magnets. And uh, um, uh, in contrast with uh, Cagnard de la Tour, uh, the, the point, the, the same critical point for magnets is actually known as the, the Curie point. So it was named after him. And this was also his uh, PhD thesis. Uh, and uh, then uh, later on, uh, Landau developed the, uh, the theory of uh, phase transitions, first order phase transitions and so on. And the, what Van der Waals did in the modern language is, uh, corresponds to uh, an example of a mean field theory that Landau and Ginsburg developed. And uh, they don't experimentally observe that the, uh, there is um, uh, the, the um, a phenomenon called scaling in the equation of state. That's why all the, the different curves, the T over um, row curves of different liquids scale properly, uh, fall into, onto the same curve. And then uh, a couple of years later, Kadanov had the um, theoretical idea to explain uh, the scaling laws that Vidom, uh, Vidom discovered. And then uh, it was uh, Wilson who developed the, the full theory of uh, renormalization group, which explains why um, the different systems like magnets or liquids and so on uh, around the critical point behave in the same way. Uh, and also um, it's the work of Wilson that uh, gives a quantitative framework to study uh, the um, equation of state uh, near the critical point. So what Van der Waals, uh, the theory of Van der Waals or Landau uh, qualitatively captures it, but what's known as the critical exponents, the, the how um, certain parameters change, that depend on the, the temperature and so on are actually um, different than what they have uh, de developed. And um, uh, there's an interesting article where I took the, 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 some of these figures from that um, on the uh, history of the, the topic. And of course, uh, even today, uh, the uh, extracting the critical exponents for different um, systems is still uh, an active area of research, which is related to uh, something called conformal bootstrap and so on. So it's still very much uh, active even uh, after about 200 years. Okay, uh, now let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, QCD. Uh, so the, the subject of my talk is um, whether there is uh, a critical point at the uh, phase transitions that occur at the QCD scale. So what is the QCD scale? Um, so uh, uh, let's again uh, begin with, uh, let me begin with crudely the uh, phase transitions in water and, and, and liquids. So the typical temperature can be very crudely estimated by looking at the strength of the intermolecular bonds, which are sort of at the order of uh, um, 10 to 100, uh, at the order of magnitude, uh, MeVs with a small m, so milli electron volts. And um, this gives a, a characteristic temperature of 100 to 1000 Kelvin where roughly speaking, uh, the, the uh, typical temperature, boiling temperatures and so on fall into this uh, range. Uh, of course, if you want to be uh, more accurate, there, there's all sorts of um, complicated sort of intermolecular structures and so on and so forth, but crudely, this is a good enough estimate. So um, in uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm interested, as I said, I'm interested in phase transitions that occur at the subnuclear scale. Uh, and that scale is determined by the strength of the bonds that uh, sort of hold the uh, protons and neutrons together. So it's basically the bonds between quarks and gluons and so on, the, the constituents of, uh, of nuclear matter. And this scale is roughly a, a few hundred MeV with a capital M. So this is mega electron volts. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, um, the mass of the proton is, is roughly uh, 1000 MeV and the mass of the lightest hadron, which is a pion, is like uh, 135 MeV. 
And uh, actually this, this binding energy that holds the quarks and gluons together in, a, in the proton is responsible for, for these, the, the values of the masses. So in, in a sense, most of the mass in the observed universe is created by these bonds uh, between quarks and gluons. And uh, the, uh, the characteristic temperature that's associated with this, uh, with this binding energy is roughly a trillion degrees, okay? So it's very, very um, uh, hot compared to the typical energy, uh, typical temperatures that we are accustomed with. But at th these energies, um, we expect the phase transition where the, uh, the temperature is enough to break these bonds so that our degrees of freedom will not be uh, quarks and gluons pack packaged as, as protons and neutrons, but um, uh, basically it will be a, 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 a plasma of quarks and gluons roaming freely. And this phase of matter is known as the quark-gluon plasma. And uh, the, the question that I'm uh, interested in uh, tackling is whether there is a similar uh, critical point in the phase transition between uh, protons and neutrons and uh, quark gluon plasma that happens at uh, these these temperatures. Um, so quark gluon plasma once filled the universe when it was roughly uh, microseconds old when the the, the temperature uh, right, uh, right after the Big Bang was hot enough that uh, uh, that the degrees of freedom. Uh, were um, freely roaming quarks and gluons. And as the universe expanded, it cooled down and the temperature fell below um, uh, this temperature scale a trillion degrees and protons and neutrons formed at that stage and then uh, formed matter as we, uh, stars and galaxies and so on much later. Uh, so this phase transition happened at some point uh, in the early universe. So let me uh, then, uh, show you this uh, rather uh, schematic diagram of phases uh, at these uh, scales. Um, uh, so here uh, in the uh, y-axis I have temperature and the x-axis I have uh, something called the baryon chemical potential. So the baryon chemical potential uh, you can view it as, a, as like doping in, 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 in condensed matter. It's, it's a proxy for energy uh, or density, sorry, it's a proxy for density. So if I go, uh, if I go uh, up in uh, y-axis, the uh, sort of environment gets hotter. If I go along the x-axis, it gets denser. Uh, so here we have very cold and dense matter. So for instance, uh, the core of compact stellar objects uh, fall here, like neutron stars and so on. At very, very high uh, densities, there are uh, certain um, proposed phases of matter. Uh, but uh, which um, can be sort of uh, calculated from theory, but hasn't been observed uh, in nature yet. Uh, so we are here, uh, where the chemical potential is uh, equal to the, the um, mass of the proton, which are the sort of the, the lightest stable uh, hadrons. And uh, if they heat it up, uh, as I said, these bonds become weaker and weaker, and eventually they break and form quark gluon plasma, and there is um, a proposed uh, first order phase transition with an endpoint here. So this is uh, the point that uh, I'm interested in, in studying in this talk. Um, so early universe uh, did something like this. It started from a, a, a very hot point with, uh, with a very low density and then cooled down and eventually came, we came uh, all the way here. Okay, now uh, if we want to study sort of this phase diagram and obtain, you know, some data from experiments, what do we do? Right? As uh, Stefan Bass uh, mentioned in his last colloquium, it's not really uh, uh, practical to create another Big Bang and uh, probably not that safe either, I suppose. Um, but um, instead, what we do is uh, create sort of uh, baby versions of the Big Bang, uh, sort of little bangs. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, the idea is to uh, take uh, two heavy nuclei, like lead and gold, uh, or uh, the, sort of the, the different nuclei as well, and collide them with a low of energy. 
So these, uh, these experiments are done at uh, particle colliders like uh, CERN uh, um, in Geneva and the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider in um, Brookhaven and Long Island. So this is an aerial view of, um, of the tunnel at CERN. Uh, so um, here you can see the Alps uh, on the background. And uh, here is, a, um, uh, is one of the detectors at CERN. Uh, where uh, the remnants of these collisions are observed. And from uh, that information, we uh, then uh, extract or, or we try to understand what happens at the, uh, at the collisions. Because when these uh, collisions uh, happen, for a very short amount of time, the ambient temperature uh, reaches a trillion degrees, but it cools down and expands. Uh, and this happens at a, a scale of uh, a few uh, femtometers and it uh, survives roughly uh, for a 10 to the minus uh, 23 seconds. Uh, so, um, and we need uh, huge detectors like this to, to, uh, to measure every sort of all the uh, remnants of the collision so that we can reverse engineer what's going on. And uh, just to give you an idea, the, uh, um, my cursor here is a, is a little smaller than a person. So uh, here there is a person. Um, so these are quite uh, large uh, detectors. Uh, so here's a cartoon of, a, or a, uh, actually a simulation of a heavy ion collision. So uh, um, as I said, two heavy nuclei uh, are collided head on. Uh, with uh, speeds very, very close to the speed of light. And at those speeds, because of the Lorentz boosts, boost, uh, they're basically pancakes. Yeah. Let, yeah. let me interrupt you for a moment. Uh, Calvin Howell has a question. Yes. Calvin, do you want to ask something? Uh, yeah, I just had a question about the phase diagram you just showed. And I was just curious, um, is there anything special um, when you uh, have the temperature enough to boil off, for instance, the lightest mesons, pions, uh, is, is that, does that show up in your kind of uh, uh, yes. uh, way actually, of looking at? Yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that. So this, this temperature at zero chemical potential is uh, roughly, uh, from, uh, from theory, it's roughly 155. Uh, MeV, so it's close to the, the mass of the tunnel. So it's 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 basically roughly QCD scale. Okay, so so that that makes that part of that boundary. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, and so these uh, heavy ions uh, collide initially. Uh, they uh, then they sort of pass through each other. As they pass through each other, they interact and create the uh, the hot plasma. It expands. As it expands, it cools down, and eventually the temperature falls below uh, the phase transition temperature. It forms hadrons, protons and neutrons, and pions and kaons and all sorts of hadrons. And then uh, what we observe in the detectors are these hadrons, the trajectories of these hadrons. So this is a real event from, um, uh, from CERN. And uh, from uh, uh, all these information about uh, th these remnants, we obtain, uh, try to extract information that what, about what happens at this stage. Uh, so uh, now in the phase diagram, uh, basically the heavy ion collisions uh, start from here and they, they, they cool down and uh, go through the phase transition and, um, uh, um, and form uh, hadrons. So the, the typical trajectories look like these. Okay, now uh, we, uh, well, we want to sort of systematically study the, uh, this region here uh, in uh, the search for uh, the conjectured uh, critical point. Okay, uh, so then what's our knob to tune, um, to, to span to uh, uh, these different regions? So the knob, uh, so uh, is uh, essentially what we can tune is the collision energy. Uh, so, uh, which is uh, measured in uh, GeV. Uh, and uh, the higher the collision energy is, the, it, it probes uh, um, 
regions which have uh, smaller uh, chemical potentials because uh, higher collision energy creates all sorts of uh, matter and antimatter. So the, the in initial sort of charge uh, density, the, the initial baron number is uh, small compared to uh, what's, what, what's created. And with, with smaller um, center of mass energy, uh, we can span through uh, higher and higher chemical potentials. Okay, so the decreasing coll collision energy can span uh, this uh, axis and um, firing chemical potential. So th this uh, study has been is being done at the relativistic heavy ion collider, and it's called the beam energy scan. And the, its its purpose is to uh, is to uh, study uh, different regions in the phase diagram with the, uh, higher chemical potentials, and in particular, uh, to look for signals for the critical path. Okay. So now, what we know, so what do we know about the phase diagram uh, from, from theory? So uh, for uh, zero chemical potential, so at zero density, um, we have lattice QCD, we, we, because we know what QCD is, we know that we have the theory of strong interactions. We can put the, the, those equations into the uh, computer and actually calculate sort of the thermodynamic properties, the equation of state and so on. Uh, so that's this axis here, mu equals zero. And from lattice QCD, we know uh, that there is a crossover. So uh, there is no sharp phase transition between quark gluon plasma and uh, hadronic matter, but there's a smooth uh, crossover. And this uh, crossover, a typical characteristic crossover temperatures, as I said, is like around 155 degrees. Um, unfortunately, when we introduce uh, a baryon chemical potential, uh, this computation uh, becomes very, very difficult for something uh, uh, because of something called the sign problem. So I will not talk about the sign problem, but uh, we can ex sort of extrapolate this lattice uh, computation to non-zero mu uh, for uh, roughly like 400 MeV. Um, so this is sort of expanding in uh, Taylor series um, in small mu uh, from the lattice computation done at uh, this axis. And uh, from that, we know that the, the, this crossover uh, continues. And uh, so far, uh, the, um, the latest results is that uh, the crossover continues up to 400 MeV, but more data is sort of um, needed to, uh, to make a sharper statement. Um, we also know uh, that if there is a critical point, uh, then that critical point uh, lies in the uh, universality class of 3D easing model, which is the same universality class as the liquid gas phase transition. This is just based on the, uh, uh, the symmetries or lack thereof of, uh, of uh, QCD with uh, massive quarks. Um, so, uh, and um, from numerical uh, studies of the 3D easing model, uh, we know what the critical equation of state is, but with a, um, with a footnote here, which I will um, clarify in the later slides. Uh, for instance, for massless quarks, we know that this universality class is different because there's a um, all four symmetry. But so uh, we know, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, the critical phenomena around the critical point, if it exists. Okay. Uh, and uh, regarding the critical point, that's uh, so far all, all we know. All right. Now, let me then uh, talk a little bit about of the physics of the critical point uh, through an example of an uh, easing ferromagnet. Okay. So um, essentially, the state of uh, a thermodynamic system is the configuration that's most likely to occur. So there are many different microscopic co configurations, but there is one that is uh, um, the most probable. And what we call the state of a thermodynamic system is that, that, that configuration. For instance, in this example, uh, uh, um, our basic uh, sort of degree of freedom is the magnetization. And we have two axes here. This is the temperature and the, the magnetic field. And uh, the um, and here I plot uh, the probability of um, a given configuration. So the x-axis is the magnetization, and the y-axis of these graphs is the probability of 
uh, having that magnetization. And that probability is, uh, it depends on certain microscopic parameters and so on. And in particular, this coefficient here is known as the, um, the correlation length, which is going to be very important. So let's see. So uh, if we have uh, a positive uh, magnetic field at low temperatures, uh, the, uh, or actually at any temperature, the, uh, the probability will look like this. So there will be a, um, a maximum for positive magnetization. So I'll sit here. Therefore, the average magnetization in this region will be positive. Uh, likewise, for negative uh, values of the external magnetic field, the average, so the, the, the probability distribution will peak here. Uh, the average magnetization will be negative. So let's, what, uh, let's see what happens at exactly at zero um, uh, um, uh, magnetic field. So at zero magnetic field, if the, uh, uh, if the temperature is small, at low temperature here, uh, there will be actually two uh, peaks which have the same uh, uh, basically probability. So this is the, the coexistence phase. So this is the uh, hallmark of a first order phase transition. If I go from here to here, uh, this peak uh, gets lower and lower and exactly at this uh, uh, boundary here, um, I have the, uh, the coexistence phase where there are two separate um, uh, um, distinct phases, okay? But if I heat up the system, uh, uh, what happens is that that uh, two peak behavior uh, turns into uh, a single maximum at zero magnetization. So at high temperatures, magnetization disappears. Uh, and exactly in between where this first order transition ends, the probability distri distribution flattens. So this, uh, these two peaks uh, turn smoothly into a single peak. And at that transition, exactly at this point, the probability distribution flattens like this, uh, where uh, the, this parameter, uh, the correlation length uh, becomes very large. So let me, uh, let's have a closer look at that point. So what happens at, the, at that point uh, is that this uh, probability distribution uh, away from the critical point, um, which is essentially a Gaussian uh, with a width, uh, uh, which is given, which is proportional to one over square root of the volume of the system, because this is basically central limit theorem. Uh, the, the width of this Gaussian distribution, it's a thermodynamic system. Uh, deviation from that most preferred uh, configuration scales as one over the square root of the number of particles, which is huge in a microscopic system. Um, and the typical system looks like this, uh, where the correlation, like correlation between sort of uh, regions, the size of regions would have the, the same sort of um, microscopic value of the magnetization is very small, okay? But when the distribu this distribution flattens, um, the central limit theorem ceases to hold and uh, the, uh, the fluctuations which are suppressed away from the critical point uh, actually become uh, sizable. And uh, actually, uh, if I look at the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the higher order fluctuations, they become even uh, larger and larger, they scale uh, with the, the, uh, the correlation length. And I have a schematically uh, a situation like this where I have these islands of positive and negative sort of um, magnetizations that sort of have uh, correlations which, which uh, correlation lengths which are comparable to the size of the volume. So the, the key word here, the key uh, physics here is that fluctuations are enhanced near the critical. So this is what happens in the, the, uh, the famous phenomenon of uh, critical opalescence. So a, a, a liquid which is otherwise um, transparent away from the critical point becomes cloudy. So there's a, this is an experiment. So it's approaching the critical point. There's a laser beam. And then uh, you can see this uh, sort of uh, cloudiness ha happening. And then now we're moving away from the critical point again. And uh, this happens because uh, the fluctuations of the density becomes enhanced uh, and uh, they, um, they, they increase in, in this system actually several orders of magnitude and the size of the, these density fluctuations become comparable to the wavelength of the laser. Uh, there, therefore, um, uh, the, the scattering 
the, the laser scatters uh, way more frequently than uh, it does away from the critical point. Okay, so the, uh, the, the, the hallmark um, signature of a critical point is enhanced fluctuations. So now let's go back to uh, QCD and heavy ion collisions and ask, well then how do we observe these fluctuations? We can't do this critical fluorescence type, we can't just look at the, um, uh, the quark gluon plasma. As I said, what we observe are the remnants of uh, this explosion. But uh, on the one hand, uh, fortunately for us, um, for each uh, collision, for each, uh, uh, each single sort of um, data for, for the experiment, we have roughly uh, 100 to 1,000 particles and we have roughly a billion events. So we have enough events uh, that we can study actually fluctuations, not only the average results, but fluctuations, okay? Um, so here, for instance, what's plotted, this is a, the uh, outcome of the experiment with different uh, center of mass energies. Uh, uh, remember, the, the smaller this number is, the larger the chemical potential. And these are the uh, distributions of the total, uh, the net proton number. Right, so we have different events. So the number of events is given in this uh, scale. So we have these very nice distributions. Uh, therefore, we can uh, uh, study uh, the fluctuations of, of these distributions. And uh, here, the proposed, the, uh, the, the, these um, uh, continuation of the beam energy scan, which uh, uh, sort of spans through that uh, um, region in the um, phase diagram where, uh, uh, and look for critical point. Um, so the number of events for the beam energy scan uh, proposed um, uh, values are given here. Uh, so that we will have significantly more data in uh, a year or so. This is the beam energy scan phase two is still ongoing. Okay. Um, now, uh, so this was the experimental side. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about what we expect from theory. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we know uh, the um, critical part of the equation of state uh, for QCD near the critical point, and we can study the fluctuations because it's in the same universality class of the 3D easing model. At the same time, what we don't know uh, is uh, how uh, these two relevant parameters of the easing uh, phase diagram, the uh, Easing temperature and the magnetic field map into the relevant uh, uh, parameters of QCD, the temperature at QCD and the baryon chemical potential. So, um, uh, and uh, of course, the location of the critical point if it exists. Uh, so, um, the, uh, this part of uh, relating the uh, easing equation of state to QCD equation of state is uh, an uh, uh, an ongoing um, research right now. There are many uh, groups that are uh, spanning different uh, parameterizations of uh, these two variables. So uh, very close to the critical point, one can linearize this relation between uh, T and H. I'm sorry, I use R here, but this is uh, T. So the easing parameters uh, to QCD. And uh, this mapping, of course, is not universal, but certain uh, uh, so certain um, signals that we expect from uh, theory are uh, universal and, and, uh, and um, uh, more robust uh, that I will um, talk uh, in the next slide, okay? So um, now, um, as I said, near the critical point, uh, the, the fluctuations are enhanced. So ideally we want to uh, look at the higher order um, uh, fluctuations, okay? Um, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, so that the, the going to higher order fluctuations, we gain something uh, from uh, the theory side because uh, the fluctuations are, higher order fluctuations are enhanced near the critical point. But from an experimental side, uh, once we have, if we have a, a finite amount uh, of uh, data points extracting from that set uh, higher and higher order correlation functions becomes more and more difficult. 
Uh, so a good compromise is uh, what's uh, known as the kurtosis. It's the fourth order uh, accumulant or the uh, correlation sort of uh, function. Um, and um, it uh, sort of uh, looks like this. So the, uh, this uh, uh, red and um, uh, blue uh, region uh, show uh, the magnitude and the sign of this fourth order correlation function in the um, with some parameterization, as I mentioned in the in the last slide, and as we uh, sort of traverse uh, here uh, different center of mass energies, therefore different uh, chemical potentials, um, the uh, kurtosis sort of changes sign and it peaks around the the, the, the critical point. Of course, uh, as uh, Stefan Bass also explained in the last colloquium, we don't uh, directly observe uh, the, um, we don't directly observe quark gluon plasma. What we observe is the, um, is, the, um, uh, is the distribution of the, 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 the final hadrons. So um, therefore we have to convert uh, what we expect from the, uh, from QCD to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to what, what would expect, what we expect uh, the distribution of the distribution of hadrons will be, okay? Uh, so uh, a uh, first step in doing that is as follows. Uh, so let me take this curve here in the temperature chemical potential plane which is below the, uh, the phase transition line. Therefore, uh, I evolve uh, the, um, the, the, so I, I look at the, uh, this, this fourth order correlation function along this line. And along this line, the, these flux, uh, sort of, um, the quark gluon plasma degrees of freedom turn into uh, uh, particles. And uh, that, so if there's a peak, oops, if there's a peak here, uh, I expect that peak to uh, also, um, to carry out into uh, the, in, the, in the distribution of uh, hadrons. So the, schematically, the, uh, the correlation function along this line, this is called the freeze-out line, by the way, because the quark gluon plasma freezes and turns into hadrons. So along this curve, uh, it looks like this. Um, so uh, the existence and the location of this little dip actually depends on how I map the easing parameters into, into QCD, but not this peak. So this is fairly robust. Uh, and uh, what is observed from, uh, so remember going in this direction is going, um, uh, going higher in the center of mass energy. And if I go uh, uh, or going uh, here uh, along larger mu is going uh, towards uh, uh, smaller center of mass energies. And if I look at the data, so this is the uh, proton, um, this, the, the kurtosis of the proton number distribution. Uh, there is uh, um, a peak. Uh, this is from the beam energy scan phase one. So of course this is um, an, a, a good hint, but of course this is nowhere near conclusive. Uh, therefore, uh, we need more data from the experiment and more quantitative uh, predictions uh, from theory, which is uh, of course uh, the subject of ongoing research by many different groups. So I will pause here, uh, stop here, and uh, move on to uh, another topic uh, that I, I then include uh, so far, um, which is the fact uh, that uh, the quark gluon plasma as created in the heavy ion collisions is not in thermal equilibrium. It's a highly dynamic environment. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, so this is a hydrodynamic simulation. It, you know, uh, this is after the collision, it cools down and it expands and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an evolving, dynamically evolving system, and um, which has many different parts. Uh, so uh, uh, there, it's a, it can be described by a sequence of different stages: the initial stage, the sort of final equilibration stage, and there, there's the hydrodynamic expansion, and then the uh, that quark gluon plasma turns into hadrons and the, there's hadronic transport. There are many different uh, phases of the evolution of a typical heavy ion collision. Uh, but uh, away from the critical point, all these uh, uh, sequential uh, stages uh, um, uh, describe the data very, very well. Uh, and this is a, a whole industry these days 
uh, to, to, to match uh, the, data, the theory to, uh, to data. Um, however, around the critical point, uh, what we also need uh, is the dynamics of fluctuations, not just static uh, um, co co uh, sort of values of the correlation functions, but the, their dynamics because uh, um, they're enhanced and they're in a uh, genuinely non-equilibrium environment. So the goal is to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to come up with a framework where the, the, this hydrodynamic uh, expansion is coupled to the dynamics of uh, critical fluctuations. So that's the goal. So let me very quickly uh, give a one slide summary of hydrodynamics. Uh, so basically hydrodynamics is a universal description of macroscopic motion of fluids, where a fluid is a macroscopic system composed of tiny fluid cells, each of which is a thermodynamic system on its own. There are many different uh, sort of uh, microscopic degrees of freedom. Um, and um, uh, therefore there are three scales uh, in, the, in the system. So there's the smallest scale, which is the microscopic scale. This is like the mean prepad. And there's the fluid cell size, which is the resolution scale of uh, hydrodynamics. So the, the fluid cell size is an infinitesimally small um, length in terms of hydrodynamics. Uh, and then there's the microscopic scale, which is much larger than the fluid cell size. And this is the scale uh, by which the, uh, the motion of the fluid uh, occurs, a wavelength, a typical wavelength of excitations and so on, which I denote with capital F. And at that, at that long scales, uh, my degrees of freedom are basically conserved quantities, right? Energy density, momentum density, Barnum number and whatnot. And uh, hydrodynamics is just a statement of a bunch of conservation laws. So I have uh, certain conserved quantities and fluxes which depend on the, 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 these conserved quantities and their, their gradients. And all the information about the viscosities and conductivity and so on are packaged into the expression of the flux, which is called the constitutive relation. And this uh, provides a, a, a dynamical evolution of hydrodynamics. Um, of course, because each fluid cell is itself a thermodynamic system, there are fluctuations. The value of that conserved quantity fluctuates at each, each cell. And uh, those fluctuations can be incorporated as random kicks in this uh, evolution of the, of the fluid. Uh, which can be uh, which can be addressed as promoting the this conserved quantity into a stochastic variable. So along the the motion of the fluid, uh, the um, my conserved quantity gets gets uh, certain kicks, uh, which are characterized by random noise. And the magnitude of this noise is uh, uh, is uh, inversely proportional the square root of the cube of the uh, the uh, cell size. This is again the statement of uh, central limit theorem. So one way to incorporate the fluctuations in hydrodynamics is just to study this system uh, uh, and incorporate noise. So of course this is also uh, an active area of research. There are different groups uh, that do this. Uh, however, there is a, 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 a technical problem, which is that the magnitude of the noise is inversely proportional to the cube root of the fluid cell size, which is a very small scale. Therefore, the magnitude of the noise is very large and practically it uh, causes certain problems which are illustrated like this. Okay. Um, so there is an alternative way to study fluctuations in, in hydrodynamics, which is uh, uh, basically, it stems from the following observation. So the ordinary hydrodynamics is basically uh, the statement of uh, the average value of the, uh, um, uh, the conserved quantity uh, follows a particular uh, differential equation. Uh, to add to it a new degree of freedom, which is the fluctuations of that variable, which is different than the, the average value. So the average, uh, what we call fluid velocity and energy density and so on are the average values. And uh, the, the fluctuations will sort of have their own dynamics. And now is the goal, the, the goal is to come up with an evolution equation for the, the fluctuations. Okay. Um, okay, so 10 more minutes and I will be done. Um, so let me just give a physical picture of what we expect. So what we expect is, uh, is that, uh, so, dif uh, so different parts of the fluid 
uh, are uh, sort of uh, are out of equilibrium in the sense that different parts of the fluid have different pressures, different temperatures, and so on. Uh, so uh, in the in the scale of the fluid, the, the the fluid itself is out of equilibrium. It tries to equilibrate, but that equilibration is is a diffusive process and it takes time. And uh, in a given in a typical characteristic time scale of the fluid, which is the size of the, uh, my typical wavelength divided by the speed of sound, only, as, uh, a, a, um, only modes which are smaller than some characteristic scale are equilibrated. So uh, this can be measured by an inverse wavelength, Q. Uh, and uh, modes uh, which lie, whose wavelengths lie between the typical scale and the equilibration scale are out of equilibrium. And they're trying to catch up with the motion of the fluid, but they're not equilibrated yet. And that's the uh, sort of the dynamics that I'm, I want to go after. And those modes uh, follow a relaxation type uh, evolution. So they, they try to relax into equilibrium with some finite relaxation time. And uh, by studying, uh, starting from the stochastic picture, we can actually derive an equation for uh, how the, these extra modes, the fluctuation, uh, behave. That's uh, uh, um, what uh, I've been doing with uh, my collaborators for the last uh, couple of years. And of course, these modes will then sneak back into what we call uh, hydrodynamics through changing uh, viscosities and conductivities and so on. So uh, the equations look very complicated. I'm not going to explain anything about this slide. Um, however, uh, by using the method of staring, they can actually be put into a simple form. And that simple form is, is basically a, a kinetic equation for phonons. So the phonons are these fluctuations and uh, the, their evolution actually is uh, a kinetic equation where uh, you can uh, um, identify the different forces, uh, the relaxation time and the equilibrium distribution. Uh, so I won't go into too much uh, uh, details. And there are other modes uh, which are purely diffusive. So there are entropy, entropy, fluctuations of entropy, 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 velocity, and velocity, velocity. These are a little bit more mysterious. These are phonons which have uh, speed of sound equals zero. These are pure relaxation equations, so there's no propagation. But again, uh, we were able to uh, derive these equations for, uh, for these different modes, which have some background terms that couple in th these equations. Uh, within, within each other. So then uh, this can be summarized by having um, um, a smooth background, uh, which is described by hydrodynamics, and uh, some fluctuation modes, which have a characteristic size, uh, which are basically relaxation equations. So now what happens near the critical point is uh, that uh, these modes, the, re the, the relaxation uh, rates of these modes uh, uh, depend on the correlation length and they actually uh, go to zero. So they, they relax, they take their time to relax, okay? Uh, which makes them fall, them out, of, fall out of equilibrium um, uh, or reach equilibrium much later than they, they, they would have if, if, if it wasn't for the critical point. And uh, this is called critical slowing down and the, the particular mode that's the slowest is the entropy entropy. So uh, because its relaxation rate is this, uh, that goes to zero uh, the quickest with the correlation length. Okay. Uh, so, um, and these fluctuations also contribute to the critical, so co contribute to the transport coefficients to viscosity, bulk viscosity diverges, thermal conductivity diverges, Shear viscosity, not so much, but still diverges. And these contributions can also be obtained from the equations that we uh, derived um, earlier. And uh, there are some experimental measurements on the uh, shear viscosity and the conductivity, for example. Okay. Um, there's also non-locality around the critical point, as I mentioned, with a very large uh, correlation length, uh, the equilibrium uh, so, sorry, the out of equilibrium uh, fluctuations uh, are inherently non local, so that has to be taken into account. And the relaxation rate also uh, um, 
get some uh, non-trivial wave vector dependence because of uh, this non-locality, which I won't go into details, but this is the final picture. Um, so uh, near the critical point, what happens is ordinary hydrodynamics without any contribution of uh, fluctuations are only good for uh, very small frequencies which scale uh, with C cube. And uh, sort of frequencies higher than this, uh, the uh, entropy entropy fluctuations fall out of equilibrium. It creates a time lag for the frequency dependent bulk viscosity and the, the, the the entropy entropy mode has to be supplemented into hydrodynamics in order to have uh, the accurate picture. Now for a little more, uh, for higher frequencies, then the entropy velocity mode also fall, falls out of equilibrium. Again, the same thing. Now this mode also has to be supplemented to hydrodynamic evolution to describe the system accurately. And finally, when the um, frequency reaches the inverse correlation length, then the whole uh, sort of uh, the, the non-localities kick in and uh, one has to incorporate the full non-local uh, picture. So, uh, um, uh, so long story short, uh, the, these evolution equations that I uh, alluded to, but not explained very uh, in detailed form, expands the region of hydrodynamics uh, near the critical point. Furthermore, they uh, give uh, the, maybe more importantly, they give a, a dynamical picture of these fluctuations, which then can be uh, uh, studied uh, quantitatively. So I will uh, skip the, the work in progress and uh, let me finish with the theoretical outlook. So what I, um, so uh, the, the question is, is there a cr critical point in the, uh, between the transition of hadrons and quark gluon plasma? And the theoretical challenge is to build a quantitative framework that incorporates the fluctuation, non-equilibrium fluctuations around the critical point. Uh, so what I presented uh, in the last part of the talk is, uh, is, um, is a set of uh, uh, evolution equations, which sort of um, is, the, uh, is the first step of, uh, of uh, um, doing that. But, um, in, in, in general, um, uh, sort of, uh, we need more um, quantitative understanding of these fluctuations. So there are many aspects of uh, this endeavor that has to be uh, further um, studied. Uh, for instance, uh, higher point correlation functions. So this is a work in progress and many other uh, groups are also studying these because those are uh, eventually related to the experimental observations that we can, uh, which would be the smoking gun uh, for for critical points, um, uh, there there are different ways to incorporate these uh, fluctuations, which are also under investigation. But uh, perhaps uh, a more imminent uh, future direction is to uh, uh, to implement these fluctuation equations into existing hydrocodes, so to get a more quantitative picture of the uh, uh, evolution of quark gluon plasma near the critical point, and especially to to, to relate these fluctuations in the quark gluon plasma to the fluctuations of uh, the final state hadrons that we observe. Uh, and finally, uh, to incorporate also first order phase transition. If there is a critical point and we pass the critical point and pass through the first order transition, what happens? That's also a question that has to be addressed more, more, more carefully. And finally, the, um, the experimental um, over, uh, outlook is also uh, promising. So uh, there is uh, the beam energy scan phase two, um, uh, which will uh, uh, go towards uh, 2021, uh, and it will reach uh, uh, chemical potentials uh, at around uh, 420 MeV roughly. So this is again the collision energy and the decreasing collision energy is increasing the, um, the chemical potential. And there are several, um, fixed target experiments uh, at, uh, um, uh, at uh, Rotovista Kavian Collider in uh, Germany and um, in Russia and so on. And that would uh, push the boundaries of the chemical potential that can be experimentally addressed to, to a higher and higher uh, value. These are future projects, uh, but the uh, way more data is, um, um, is on the way. So this is um, 
exciting times for uh, uh, hunting for the, the, the critical point. And um, thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer any uh, questions. So thanks very much, Gukta. Um, I'll, I'll clap for everybody here. <laughs> Nicely done. Um, and now the floor is open for questions. Um, here at Duke, when we do our colloquia, we like to uh, give an opportunity first for graduate students or undergraduate students to to ask questions before before the uh, professors jump in. So if there is a student who would like to ask a question, um, you can use the raise hand. Um, I'll give you a few seconds. I'm not seeing any hands go up from students, so let's open it up to anybody who has a question. There was one hand up, I think. I know, sorry, somebody's clapping. Different, yeah. different, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Kent Long. Yeah, sorry, I did change from uh, hands up to clapping and then back again. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask about the, are there any um, cosmology implications of these density fluctuations? I, 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 I'm not too familiar with the energy scale. Are these all uh, post-inflation? Are there uh, uh, applications in say uh, baryogenesis kind of uh, models? So, uh, um probably not the critical fluctuations, but the uh, fluctu sorry, fluctuations, uh, sorry, um, hydrodynamics with fluctuations in principle, yeah, so basically these, um, uh, th th these set of equations um, describe any uh, thermal fluctuation um, that happens uh, in a hydrodynamic system. Uh, well, uh, of course, typically, uh, in microscopic systems, these um, uh, these fluctuations are suppressed uh, by the number of degrees of freedom, which are you know the microscopic scale, ten to the twenty-four or something. In heavy ion collisions, the heavy ion collisions is sort of in a is in a uh, um, in a funny range where the number of particles is large enough that it can be described theoretically, sort of hydrodynamically, like a uh, hundred to a thousand, but still fluctuations might uh, be observed. So um, for the early universe, I, um, uh, so in terms of quark gluon plasma, any um, fluctuation uh, that happens around the microsecond will be uh, washed out. Um, however, uh, with the uh, electroweak phase transition or even uh, inflation, there might be an application, but not at the top of my head. Other questions? Let, let me ask one. Um, the, the, uh, the fact that um, we had two talks on quark gluon plasma and, and QCD and hydrodynamics in a row was not planned, um, but it, it indicates you know, that there is really a strong interest in these topics at Duke and UNC both. Um, and uh, since it was only a couple of weeks ago, and we all remember it, um, could you place the regime that Stefan Boss is studying on your phase diagram? Where, where is the ideal liquid? Um, so I will attempt, and uh, Stefan, please correct me if uh, I say something wrong. Um, uh, so actually, uh, um, so anywhere here, um, away from the critical point, um, is uh, very well described uh, by uh, hydrodynamics, especially as you go to uh, higher center of mass energies, uh, you get closer and closer uh, to um, um, 
So it's 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 never an ideal fluid. There's you you, you always need uh, uh, some uh, viscosity, and uh, there's um, there's a temperature dependence of viscosity, which is extracted by uh, um, from his work, uh, and uh, uh, that sort of viscosity sort of gets smaller and smaller as we sort of uh, decrease the temperature to some extent here. But uh, I would say anywhere um, away from the, 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 the critical point um, that uh, the description of uh, heavy ion collisions actually uh, work very well. Uh, and there are even actually, I'll um, uh, go a little further, and there are even um, um, systems uh, where um, a heavy ion is collided with a proton. So these are sort of asymmetric collisions. And uh, most of those uh, experiments uh, create sort of the maybe order 20 particles, but some of them uh, uh, create an unusually large uh, number of final state particles. Um, and those, uh, but there is enough data to actually select those events, which sort of a, a proton nucleus collision creates a very large number of particles. And I would say even those uh, are, are described fairly well uh, with hydrodynamics. And I think that's, that was one of the things that uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, Stefan is uh, uh, going to do in the future with the this um, uh, Bayesian uh, methods. So um, yeah, so uh, if I said something wrong, please correct me, Stefan. Uh, so uh, Jailesh Chandra Sekharan has a question. Hi, um, just looking uh, maybe to the long-term future. Yes. Uh, at some point if, when you're studying these uh, beyond equilibrium kind of questions, you still hopefully will want to ask if there are quantities that one can compute maybe in QCD and then use that as some effective parameters in your hydrodynamic calculations. Now, can you, um, maybe I missed this, maybe it came about in your talk. Can you tell us how many parameters from sort of microscopic QCD will we need at some point um. if at all we want to make that connection? Right, so for, for the fluctuations, basically um, uh, all uh, that goes into uh, these fluctuations are, um, um, uh, um, are actually contained uh, here in the sort of the, 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 the stochastic, um, uh, uh, the stochastic picture and uh, those are the, um, well, we need the equation of state uh, and uh, we need the transport coefficients viscosity, conductivity, um, and so on. And once those are uh, uh, determined, um, then these, uh, these evolution equations uh, depend only on those transport coefficients and the equation of state. So uh, this is away from the critical point. And near the critical point, we also need uh, how the, the sort of the, the correlation length uh, depends uh, on, on the, the QCD parameters, temperature and chemical potential. Uh, and uh, so that is sort of this part. Uh, and unfortunately, this, it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, at least right now, it's not possible to directly extract uh, this, the equation of state in, in, if there's a critical point near the critical point uh, from, uh, from the QCD. Um, and certain things will depend on uh, uh, these these parameters that uh, relate the the scaling equation of state and the QCD equation of state. So one thing actually uh, would be perhaps very uh, useful is to uh, um, to incorporate this whole Bayesian uh, machinery to have all these sort of uh, extra uh, parameters near the critical region, sort of the the, uh, the parameters that determine this, this mapping in addition to the viscosities and so on and so forth and see um, uh, what type of um, uh, sort of what values of these parameters uh, this, uh, describe the best sort of these types of measurements around uh, the critical point. Um, so these are not really uh, uh, 
independent um, sort of uh, the sort of uh, parameters, but they do depend on the equation of state of QCD. Let's take one more question from Calvin Howell. Calvin, are you there? Yeah, sorry. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, yeah, on your last slide, uh, you talked about maybe exploring first order transitions. Uh, yes. And so uh, yeah. this is a little too naive thinking, but when you, those words bring to my mind um, the image of being able to, for instance, uh, observe something where the chemical energy chemical potential may be changing at a constant temperature, something of that order. Uh, how, do you, how do you, in practice, how do you en en envision an experiment where you measure, you know, the debris from a collision uh, to map out something like that? Yeah, so that's not, that's not a direct, uh, um, right, so let's see. So for instance, if you look at these, where is it? Ah, yeah. If, you look at these typical curves. Um, so um, uh, one sort of quick way to think about uh, these cooling curves is that so uh, we're here, the avion collisions transport us uh, here, and then the system sort of cools down and so on. And you can take, you can, for instance, look at the isentropic trajectories, for instance, it's sort of a, 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 um, a quick way to see sort of what trajectory that they will follow in the phase diagram. So th there will be some curves here that pass through the uh, the, the phase transition and so on. Uh, if 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 for some reason let's say um, I end up here, uh, then these isentropic uh, trajectory will uh, come to the first order phase transition, uh, then uh, move along there along the transition and emerge somewhere sort of closer to the critical point, something like that. And uh, this information somehow will be uh, uh, included in the uh, um, equation of state uh, of uh, QCD with some uh, probably modeling with using, um, using uh, equation of state and so on. Um, but uh, uh, that would sort of be already uh, incorporated in the um, uh, in the uh, in the evolution through the equation of state, um, and maybe like through Maxwell construction or something like that. Um, another thing that one one can do perhaps is to incorporate sort of dynamics of uh, bubbles in the um, uh, in the hydrodynamic picture. But I don't have a very sort of uh, um, a good understanding of how how that might uh, also be done. Um, but basically the answer is through the uh, equation of state and all the sort of discontinuities and so on will, will, will be there. Thank you. Josh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to thank Professor Bashar for a nice talk. Um, I wish we could all gather around for some some cookies and maybe uh, Professor Bashar could provide some music for us during the after party. Um, but um, I did want to just say before we leave that the next colloquium in this series will be uh, two weeks from last Monday, so September 21st, and we'll have Professor Sarah Haravifard talking about quantum materials. Um, so let's look forward to that. Um, it's great to have everybody together, and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you. Thank you.